Ian is the assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Nottingham. Before that, he was the Addison Wheeler Fellow and a part-time lecturer at Durham. He has also spent time teaching at Leeds, uh, teaching philosophy of religion, and his teaching and research interests have spanned Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, illness, misanthropy, virtues, and vices. He has sustained like, he has sustained contributions in efforts to improve intellectual and demographic diversity in philosophy. And he's given talks and workshops and contributed to curricular diversification projects. He also serves on the executive committee of the British Philosophical Association. If you haven't visited his website, I highly urge you to because uh, just the span of the things that Ian does is, is breathtaking from popular media writing to appearing on YouTube channels and, uh, and of course, uh, prolifically publishing. So welcome, Ian. Thank you uh, for uh, agreeing to give us this talk. Um, the format's going to be, Ian's going to have 45 minutes to uh, give his talk. There is, I believe, a handout that Shuddhu will share in the chat so you can follow along. And uh, after that, we'll break for five minutes and then go on to questions and answers. So over to you. Cool. Um, well, thank you, Jinke, for a very generous introduction um, to the BPA for organizing the event and also for the invitation. Um, Ten years ago, when I was a, a lowly postgrad, um, I organized a BPA conference at Durham. Um, I can't believe that's a decade now, so I think I count as officially old. Um, what I want to talk about here is I think a, a genuinely radical um, style of philosophy. I want to introduce and to defend um, a form of philosophical misanthropy. Now, this is, of course, a neglected topic in philosophy. Um, there aren't many books on misanthropy. There's not much for literature. There are not many self-identified philosophical misanthropes. We have objectivists, sentimentalists, moral realists, anti-realists, and so on, but not very many philosophical misanthropes. It's not a category used by moral philosophers. It's not a category used by historians of philosophy. Um, it is a neglected topic. And for some of the very few people who have written on it, it's neglected for a good reason. Um, so Andrew Gibson is one of the very few people who's written on misanthropy. And he opens his book by saying, misanthropy is an impossible doctrine. Um, he says, no one could be a misanthrope. But his argument for this is that a misanthrope is someone who he thinks hates or condemns humankind. They are themselves a member of humankind. Therefore, the misanthrope must be guilty of self-hatred or self-loathing. But unfortunately, Gibson gives us no reason to think that self-hatred and self-loathing is impossible. Um, in my experience, self-hatred and self-loathing is not only possible in principle, but unfortunately very, very common in practice. So that seems to me a very bad objection to misanthropy. It's perfectly possible for a human being to have moral condemnation of humankind and still recognize themselves as you know, part of the problem. And this points, I think, to a very general problem with trying to philosophize about misanthropy as what well. there are just no good working definitions of what misanthropy is. And when philosophers do occasionally engage with misanthropy, they usually run with a dictionary definition. So the OED says misanthropy is hatred of human beings or of humankind. And when philosophers do sometimes discuss it, that's what they have in mind. So Judith Schlar and Bernard Williams, they both very briskly condemn misanthropy because they think it encourages hatred and condones violence against human beings. Um, in that, they're following Kant. And part of what I want to argue here is that misanthropy does not require hatred of human beings at all, nor need it actually condemn violence. Misanthropy is actually a much, a much broader, a much more complex set of philosophical doctrines. And I'll end the talk by describing a whole variety of different styles of misanthropy. Some of them should invite condemnation, but others should be taken seriously as live options for philosophers. So misanthropy is not hatred of human beings. It is not an attitude of violence towards human society or human life. It is a complex and rich doctrine, and one, I think, whose time has come. Um, I think this is, for various reasons, a very good time to try to motivate forms of philosophical misanthropy. Now, I'll take my starting point from the work of David Cooper, um, emeritus professor at Durham. Now, David is one of the very few self-identified philosophical misanthropes. And two years ago, he published a book called Animals and Misanthropy. And as you might guess from the title, David's claim very, very simply is that 
any honest, sober assessment of human beings' treatment of animals justifies a charge of misanthropy. It justifies systematic moral condemnation of human beings because the systematic exploitation and destruction of billions and billions and billions of animals that's built into contemporary human life justifies moral condemnation of that form of life. Um, David has a variety of arguments for this, um, but what I wanna take from him is just his working definition of misanthropy. It's the one that I want to endorse and recommend to you. And it has three parts. So first of all, David says that misanthropy is fundamentally a critical judgment or verdict on humankind. It's not an attitude of hatred or of loathing or disgust. Those affects are a secondary and contingent feature. What's fundamental is that misanthropy takes a form of a critical judgment or verdict on humankind. Second, it is a judgment of, of something collective like humankind, human existence, human forms of life. So the misanthrop is not absurdly condemning like every individual person. You know, they haven't gone and interviewed people. The misanthrop is condemning the wider cultures and structures of human life or human existence as they've come to be. So it is a collective judgment. But then third, the condemnatory aspect, the reason the misanthrop has the critical judgment is because they see human life or human existence as being just saturated with a whole, whole variety of vices and failings. And these vices and failings are very diverse. They're not confined just to the moral vices like cruelty and malevolence. The misanthrope, depending on their, their commitments, might be condemning us for our moral failings, our epistemic failings, our affective and spiritual failings. And these might range very broadly from collective ignorance, structural violence, inequality, myopia, dogmatism, wastefulness, godlessness. There's an extremely long list. And if you start to read um, some philosophical misanthropes, including the ones I'll mention, misanthropes really, really, really like lists. So Schopenhauer and uh, Kant, for example, have long, long lists of all of our vices, failings, shortcomings, deficiencies, and defects. If you read the Buddhist catalogues of our cankers, taints, defilements, hindrances, long, long analyses of everything that's wrong with us. Or if you read the Christian and especially the Calvinist catalogues of our vices, sins, failings, and infirmities, what you find are misanthropes documenting a whole wide array of collectivized vices and failings, ethical, epistemic, spiritual, um, aesthetic, and so on. But the misanthrope is not just saying, you know, by the way, there are vices and failings out there. It's crucial that these vices and failings have three special features. First, they have to be entrenched. They have to be deeply built into the structures and the norms of human society. So if the misanthrope, um, the, the wastefulness and the exploitativeness of human society, these are not just superficial surface features of human life that you could just scrape off with a bit of moral activism. These are deeply baked into the foundations of what has come to be mainstream human life. So they are entrenched, deeply rooted. Second feature, these vices and failings have to be ubiquitous in the sense of being spread all throughout the different areas and departments of human life. Um, so Kant, in a rare moment of poetry, says, um, in the human world, there is no hallow abode in which virtue is safe from its enemies. He says, in all areas of the human world, you will find these festering vices and failings. And that's one reason that lots of modern eco-misanthropes like to use metaphors that connote the spreading of our failings. So eco-misanthropes will say things like, human beings are a cancer, it's a virus, we are a disease, and our failings spread all throughout the different areas of our life. So the failings are ubiquitous, they are entrenched, but also they're pronounced in the sense of being upfront, visible, openly displayed. So again, Kant says that our failings, he says, parade themselves before us. They are openly displayed. People do not feel shameful um, about their vices. And of course, in everyday language, we will talk about blatant hypocrisy, for instance, or naked selfishness. There is the idea that our vices and failings are on full display. So they are everywhere, they are deeply built in, and they are upfront. They are very obvious features of our world. You know, so if the misanthrope, <laughs> it's not as if you have to look hard to find human vices and failings. You just have to look in the newspaper or out of the window or in the mirror, and you'll find abundant examples. Now, of course, that's 
consistent with the claim that some of the vices will be more deeply rooted than others. So maybe it is the case that exploitativeness and injustice are deeply baked into our societies, maybe in a way that, I don't know, superficiality isn't. And it's consistent with the claim that some of the vices are more numerous than others. So Schopenhauer likes to talk about, um, in his phrase, um, the egotism of everybody, the selfishness of many, the cruelty of few. So the misanthropic can acknowledge the vices have differential distributions throughout the human population. Maybe some vices are more common than others. But the claim then is that misanthropy is this systematic critical verdict on humankind, human culture, human life as a whole, because it's saturated with a whole variety of vices and failings that are ubiquitous, entrenched, and pronounced. And already, I think, what David Cooper offers is a huge improvement on what Kant and Schopenhauer suggest is misanthropy, which is hatred and violence. What you see here is a complex assemblage of different emotions, reflections, and behaviors. I mean, there is the strong affective component of misanthropy, um, but there are also critical judgments and reflections. There is evident sensitivity. And one thing that a misanthrope would want to do then is to tell a story about how one becomes a misanthrope. So Kant and Schopenhauer's story is, is pretty good, although it's very schematic. So for Kant and Schopenhauer, it begins with um, long, sad experiences of injustice and cruelty and tyranny and selfishness and over-sentimentality. And these negative experiences drive sadness and frustration, which calls our attention to wider patterns of behavior, which drives critical reflections. We start to notice and to think, and then we start to condemn. And then there's a dialectic of emotions and experiences and feelings. And then says Kant, this generates a melancholy mood, which if it persists will culminate in philosophical misanthropy. And that's the working analysis that I want to endorse in what follows. Misanthropy then is systematic moral condemnation of the moral character of humankind as it's come to be. Two quick qualifications on this. The first is that the misanthrope is not targeting individuals. It's perfectly consistent for a misanthrope to have a collective condemnation of human beings at large, while acknowledging that some individual human beings might be very good. So the writer Jonathan Swift, the Gulliver's Travels author, he's very, very misanthropic. He's wonderfully misanthropic. Um, and he delights in describing the awfulness of human beings. But Jonathan Swift says in a letter, he says, I hate this writhing mass called humanity, he says, but, you know, Robert and John and Thomas, they're good people. They are exceptions to the moral norm. He says there are persons of virtue in the world, like Kant's persons of goodwill. They're very rare, but he says that's why they stand out as significant. There might be moral exemplars in Linda Zagzebski's sense, people of unusual and outstanding moral character, people who seem remarkably resistant to the corrupting temptations of wider human life. So the misanthrope can allow that there are virtuous individuals and exceptions. And they can also allow though, that some individual human beings are also especially emblematic of the wider vices and failings of the rest of us. They are living symbols of all that is worst about human beings. Uh, so think about the very obvious example, the outgoing president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, who recently lost an election um, and he really did lose an election. But when people describe Trump, one of the things they often say is that he is a symbol of all that's wrong with, with America or with patriarchy or with capitalism or with human beings. He is a living symbol of greed and narcissism and arrogance and dogmatism in their purest forms. So he's a negative exemplar. So although the misanthrope is not condemning individuals, they can allow some individuals are just peculiarly exemplary of our failings. The whole awfulness of human beings is distilled into that individual. These, what's, what Schopenhauer calls satanic devilish characters. So though it's not a judgment of individual human beings, there is that sensitivity. There are exceptionally virtuous persons and there are exceptionally vicious persons. Second qualification, when the misanthrope condemns human beings or humanity, they're not necessarily condemning human nature. So there's a common tendency in Western philosophical misanthropy to assume you gotta have a theory of human nature. I think part of the reason here is the enormous influence of Christian theological anthropology, particularly the doctrine of original sin. The idea that human beings created in their Edenic state were morally perfect, 
And then, you know, it all goes wrong with the snake or with Eve, if you're fond of misogynistic theology. And then human beings then have been permanently damaged. We inherited original sin. And that's encouraged the idea that a misanthrop must have a theory of human nature. But I think that's simply false. One way to see that it's false is to look at philosophical misanthropy in other cultures. So if you look at um, the classical period of, of Chinese philosophy in the fourth, fifth century, what I think you find is that all the major classical Chinese schools were highly misanthropic. Confucians, Taoists, the Yangists, the Moists, the so-called legalists, they all shared in a misanthropic denunciation of humanity, but they have widely differing views on human nature. Confucius says nothing at all about human nature. Um, the Yangists have a very thin conception of human nature. The Moists have a really neutral conception of human nature. So you don't need a conception of human nature at all. All you need to say is human beings as they are in their current state have come to be systematically awful. You don't need to appeal at all to anything about human nature. And that's a point that I think is ignored by some modern um, philosophical philanthropes, like the writer um, Rutger Bregman. So he wrote a very popular book this year called Humankind. It's a nice pun. And his claim is that human beings are deep down, fundamentally good creatures. Um, in his very cutesy term, homo sapiens are homo puppies. We are by nature, friendly, warm, playful creatures, sensitive to one another's needs and feelings. And for that reason, says Bregman, we shouldn't be misanthropes. But of course that claim is simply irrelevant. It doesn't matter what we were like way back when or deep down. What matters for the misanthrope is our collectively manifest behaviors and attitudes. And actually, if you read Bregman's book, often he sounds like he's making the case for misanthropy. He talks constantly about our collectivized greed, selfishness, violence, delusionalness, myopia, and so on, and then tells himself a consoling story about what we used to be way back when. But for the misanthrope, that's irrelevant. You don't need a theory of human nature at all. And you don't need to think that we are fundamentally flawed by nature, just that we've been contingently corrupted by the ways that our society has developed. So here, the person to look to really is Rousseau. So if you remember Rousseau's distinction between natural and civilized man, you know, Rousseau's claim is that maybe in our original state of natural man, human beings maybe were very good and, you know, innocent and just and fair. But, says Rousseau, a lot has happened since we were in the, the natural state of um, human beings. We've undergone a process of, civiliz of civilization, so-called, and we've acquired things along the way, like private property and social hierarchy. And Rousseau tells, tells, I think, a very compelling story about the ways that as we transition to civilized man, and start to construct ever more elaborate societies, what we've really been doing is scaffolding our vices and failings. So Rousseau's very famous example was the introduction of private property. He says, the first person who marked out a piece of land and says, this is mine, he says, that person gave birth to all the vices of humankind. Because once you have institutions like private property or social hierarchies, that is a scaffold for our greediness, our covetousness, our aggressiveness, our snobbishness, and our hypocrisy. And Rousseau tells a very compelling story about the ways that the increasingly complex and artificial character of our society massively scaffolds our vices and failings. So think about the ways that vices like snobbishness or contemptuousness, they need social hierarchies. Vices like covetousness and greed and selfishness and competitiveness, they require these collective scaffolds. And once you look at things in that perspective, you don't need to have any theory of human nature at all. You just need to have a story about how the process of civilization has introduced corrupting influences and structures that human beings are massively susceptible to. And as I understand, that's a thesis that is confirmed by many cu cultural historians and anthropologists. Um, so the big one apparently was the introduction of agriculture, which allowed certain kinds of division of labor, which set in process a whole motion of injustice, exploitation and violence. So you, need, so you can be a philosophical misanthrope and have no view of human nature at all. So that's a working analysis then of misanthropy. Systematic moral condemnation of humankind as it's come to be. Because you recognize that the structures, norms, ambitions that constitute humanity are massively corrupted by vices and failings of a whole variety of kinds. And although I won't go into this detail, what vices and failings you worry about and what story you tell about how we came to be like this, that will depend upon contingent features of your culture. 
So, for instance, if you live in a highly theistic society, the stories you tell about how we came to be this way will necessarily involve God. You might tell a story about original sin and corruption and satanic influences, whereas, let's say, classical Chinese philosophy, no such theistic structure, they will tell a different kind of story. And what kinds of vices and failings are salient for you will also depend upon your background, moral and cultural com convictions. Um, so speaking to my students in my ethics class, we're doing misanthropy now, they have a particular focus upon vices and failings like inequality, unfairness and discrimination, as you would expect from students born into this sort of society, buying into a broadly liberal moral philosophy, but shuffle across to other cultures and different vices and failings come into view. So Confucians, for instance, emphasize a lot of social and epistemic and aesthetic failings like banality, superficiality, insensitivity to beauty, lack of respect for cultural tradition, philistinism. So the vices and failings will vary as will your explanatory stories about how we came to be this way. And that's what you find, I think, if you look at the history of philosophy, you find people constructing doctrines of philosophical misanthropy, drawing upon their background, moral, cultural, and metaphysical convictions, but all for the purpose of articulating systematic condemnation of human beings as they've come to be. So that will be a form of, a general form of philosophical misanthropy. Of course, the next big question would be, well, okay, what does it mean then to be a misanthrope? I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you do misanthropy, as one of my students asked me? Now, one thing to emphasize here is that misanthropy, as I've described it, is not going to be a, a cold or a neutral doctrine. Um, so there are many philosophical doctrines that if you accept them, they don't really have any existential or practical impact upon your life. So if I acquire the ontological view that there are no material objects, that's not really going to have any impact at all upon my sense of being home in the world or my practical conduct. I will carry on living, thinking and feeling as I did before. I just have a new ontological thesis on the shelf. But misanthropy is not like that, because once you internalize a misanthropic vision of the world, it will necessarily change your perceptions, feelings, attitudes, judgments, and your sense of trust in the world. It's one of those doctrines that, as William James says, it grows hot and alive within you. It crystallizes in certain ways and fundamentally transforms your entire orientation towards the world. And so what you want to know then is, well, what will my world be like once I internalize a misanthropic vision? A parallel here that many of my feminist students liked was the comparison of what it's like to become a feminist. Once you internalize a properly sophisticated understanding of structures of patriarchy, the world just looks very different. It looks more hostile and more inhospitable. The moral character of the world changes. You now see it in a sense for what it really was all along. A certain kind of naivety falls away and you see the truth of the world. And that's important as well to the misanthrope. Once you see the world in this way, it will transform how you live and you think and you feel. That's also why it's not a doctrine to be taken lightly. I mean, I, I criticize Judith Schlar and Bernard Williams for dismissing misanthropy, but in a certain sense, they're right. You do have to consider the, the existential ramifications of certain doctrines, doctrines that will transform a person's character and identity and sense of trust in the world, doctrines that can't be treated lightly, and I think misanthropy is one of those. So what I want to do now is to describe four main ways of being a misanthrope, what I will call misanthropic stances, distinctive ways of being a misanthrope. Now, no doubt there are many, but I think there are four main ones. When I've searched across the Western Indian and Chinese traditions, there are four main misanthropic stances that I see. Now, Kant describes the first two for me. Now, he distinguishes the stances by their affects and emotions. I think that's wrong. I think they're distinguished by their practical behaviors, but we'll get to that. So the first one is what Kant calls the enemy of mankind. He says, this misanthrope is characterized fundamentally by enmity, this combination of dislike of human beings and ill will, the desire to harm them. Because of course you could dislike something but not want to harm it. In fact, you can dislike things and people and still help them. But the enemy of mankind, says Kant, has sustained systematic enmity. They have attitudes of hatred and disgust at human beings, and they express this practically with projects of violence. So think about many eco-misanthropes of the more radical sort. 
with their rhetoric of tearing it all down, unmaking civilization, breaking the machine. The enemy misanthrope combines hatefulness and violence. And this is why Kant condemns him as hateful and contemptible, because for Kant to hate human beings as dignified rational creatures made by God is appalling and unacceptable. And the, the attitude of enmity wanting to harm and destroy human beings either through literal acts of violence or through symbolic acts like defacing people's ideals or tearing down their beliefs and ideals is just contemptible. And that, says Kant, is one style of misanthrope. And notice, that's the style of misanthrope that many philosophers presuppose. So when Schlar and Williams condemn misanthropy, it's actually the enemy stance that they're condemning. And I think they're getting it from Kant. But what they're not recognizing that there are other ways to be a misanthrope including the second one described by Kant. And this is the misanthrope he calls the fugitive from mankind. And Kant is a bit gentler about this one. So the fugitive's dominant emotion, he says, is fear. The fugitive is someone who sees the systematic moral corruption of human beings, and they respond with a multi-level fear. They fear the physical and the moral harms of being amongst human beings, violent, covetous, and selfish as they are. They fear the moral distress of being within and a part of that world. They feel the guilt of complicity in these wider corrupting structures. And also they, they are afraid of the morally corrupting realities of being amongst human beings. So the fugitive looks at the human world with all of its vices and failings as a source of complex risks, including a fundamental risk to their own moral integrity. So again, think about metaphors of toxicity and poisoning. Once you see how morally poisonous and toxic the human world is, a natural response for the fugitive is to flee, to get away into a safer environment. And as Kant says, fugitivism really is um, a series of processes, not an action. There might be some missing fugitives who just flee like straight away. You know, they have a horrible experience and they escape. But really, he says, there are processes of withdrawal, a slow disengagement from the human world, becoming more retreated, more reclusive, slowly withdrawing from the human world, disengaging from its more corrupting areas and pulling back. So we might think about um, a variety of kinds of fugitive like um, hippies, dropouts, survivalists, those who want to live off the grid, those who try to live off the land, those who escape into secluded communities that are relatively free by design from the wider human vices and failings. The obvious example which Kant admires are monasteries and religious orders. So uh, one of the Buddha's teachings, which is always neglected in the West, is that the monastic life is superior. So Buddhism has this very tolerant, easygoing um, image in the West, which is very, very false. The Buddha is very clear. The best sort of life is that of a Buddhist monk. The next best life is a Buddhist layperson. The next best life is all the rest, Hindus, Jains, and all the rest of them. And the reason that the Buddha gives for the superiority of the monastic life, what he calls the noble quest, is because in a monastic community, um, the various corrupting structures are not present. So of course, monks can't own private property. They have a deliberately uniform appearance. They are required to be celibate and to restrain from sexual activity. There is a strict organization of work. And the function of all of this, says the Buddha, is to minimize the structural incentives towards lustfulness, greed, hatefulness, and competitiveness. So the monasteries, he says, properly done, properly done, are not vice-free, but they have been vice-proof to a significant degree. And they, he says, are communities that you should escape into, which is also why um, in the ancient Indian tradition, monasteries are physically isolated. They're in difficult to get to locations, mountains, rivers, etc. They're hard to get to. They're often physically sealed off. There are strict procedures for controlling who can come in, And when you're within a monastery, your life is rigidly controlled. So if you read the Buddhist monastic code, the Prakta Moksha, there's an extraordinarily complex structure of discipline and rules, the purpose of which is to contain people's vicious impulses and try to incentivize their virtues. So that is a form of fugitivism. And it comes in stages of gradual flight or retreat. But that's a second kind of misanthrope, the fugitive. And Kant is a little more sympathetic to that one. Now, when Kant discusses the enemy and the fugitive, he says what distinguishes them is the emotions. The enemy um, is hateful. The fugitive is fearful. 
but I think I, I think that's that's just obviously wrong. I mean, for one thing, you can swap out the motivations and the behaviors. So one thing that drives a lot of violence is hatefulness, but also fear. A lot of the violence that people perpetrate comes from a f- place of fear. So you could have fugitive motivations, but enemy behaviors. Likewise, one of the reasons that people might flee their corrupting society is fear. Another one is hatred. I mean, people might naturally pull away from the things that they hate and try to escape. So I think the stances can't be distinguished by their emotions. There are no doubt many hateful fugitives who are fleeing what they hate, and no doubt many fearful enemies who are attacking what they fear. So really what distinguishes the stances is the behavior, the projects of violence for the enemy, projects of flight and escape for the fugitive. Another limitation of Kant's account is that there are other ways of being a misanthrope that he doesn't mention. Now, I'm not sure why he fixates on the enemy and the fugitive. Um, I don't know. But there are at least two other main misanthropic stances that he doesn't consider. And to see them, it's useful to look at other philosophical traditions. So the third is what I will call the misan- what I will call the activist misanthrope. So this is the person or the group who looks at the human world, sees its structural vices and failings, and responds not with violent disruption, not with flight, but instead by rolling up their sleeves and doing the work to try to systematically transform the moral character of humankind for the better. They engage in large-scale ameliorative efforts in trying to reconstruct the human world. For example, by identifying those highly corrupting structures and dismantling or reforming them, by trying to put in place collective structural measures to incentivize virtues and excellences. By far the best example I found is Confucius. Now, Confucius, as I've argued, was a misanthrope. He looked at his society and saw a complex process of moral decline, lack of respect for tradition, forgetting the teachings of the sage kings, increasing hypocrisy, violence, etc., etc. But at least in his early life, Confucius's response was to become an activist misanthrope. He engaged in what we would recognize as activistic projects. So he starts to recruit a team of disciples, he trains them up, he provides free education and teaching way ahead of his time. He tries to form communities, he interacts with rulers, he offers counsel and guidance, he tries to spread his teachings to people, he tries to reactivate people's love of tradition and the moral resources it contains, and devoted decades of his life to constantly traveling around ancient China, trying to find good people and stirring up actions and behaviors. And in that, he had a limited degree of success. You know, he did, for instance, place many of his students in significant parts of the, of the Chinese bureaucratic system. He did very successfully promote people's behavior through a combination of personal charisma, collective organization, and trying to build an infrastructure for transformation, which is not to say that it was always very successful and he had a very hard life. There were many, many years of wandering, starvation, two assassination attempts, rulers rebuffing him. But still, as Confucius is very clear, He says the correct response of the moral person confronted with a corrupted society is to do the work. And Confucius is very explicit. He says, we must not flee into the mountains or sail away in a raft. He says, where would we escape to? We would always escape into some human society where we would find more corruption. So the better thing to do, he says, is to remain in your society, identify its existing cultural and moral resources and transform it for the better. And Confucius had grounds for hope here, because when he looked at his society, he recognized there was structural potential for transformation. So there's a third kind of misanthrope, the activist, who regards us as structurally morally corrupted, but also as reparable, as being open, at least in principle, to collective transformation for the better. Not by reforming human nature, about which he said nothing, but by transforming collective social structures. So there's a third kind of misanthrope. We've had the enemy, the fugitive, and now the activist. But if we stay in classical China, there's also a fourth misanthropic stance. It's not unique to ancient China. This is what I will call the quietest misanthrope. Now, like all the other mis- all, the, all the other stances, the quietest looks at their society and sees it as saturated with entrenched, ubiquitous vices and failings. But they also judge that nothing could be done collectively to transform those vices and failings. Maybe they think they are too entrenched, too pronounced, too ubiquitous. Maybe they recognize that there aren't the moral resources for reform. There aren't enough good people. There aren't enough receptive rulers or whatever. 
So the quietest response is to seek out strategies of personal accommodation, finding ways of living within societies in quiet, inconspicuous ways that minimize the corrupting risks of what Zhuang Tzu calls entanglement with the world, allowing you to live within it, but in relatively morally safe ways. And the best example here is the Taoist Zhuang Tzu, or Chuang Tzu, um, as you would probably know him. Now, he, he agrees with Confucius that their society was systematically corrupt, but he says the correct response is, he says, not to sweat yourself to death trying to reform the world, but instead to identify quiet, inconspicuous ways of living, where you can keep up with the goods of human life, like friendship, fa um, solidarity, interpersonal relationships, raising a family, meet some sort of meaningful employment, but you just avoid entanglement in the more corrupting areas of life. So Zhuang is very clear, you stay out of politics, you don't go into the military, you don't get involved in cultural fads and controversies, you live quietly and inconspicuously within your society. If you want other examples, um, think about the Epicureans. They have a strong form of um, quietism as well. The ideal to live in relatively quiet, tranquil, uninterrupted peace within your society, playing a minimal role and only stepping into the controversies of your society when absolutely necessary, but otherwise living out quietistically in a way that balances your needs for human sociability with your awareness that your society is systematically corrupt. Another good example is Buddhism. If you look at the Eightfold Path of Buddhism, it contains a strict system of parameters for guiding how you can be able to live in your world whilst exercising the Buddhist virtues of calm, peace, equanimity, and tranquility and self-control, but also minimizing your entanglement with the wider world. Stay out of these professions, don't speak in these ways, don't live in those ways. So there are then four misanthropic stances, and I've only briefly sketched them for you. There is the enemy and the fugitive. There is the activist and the quietist. They're all united by their common critical verdict on the moral character of humankind as it's come to be, but they significantly differ in their practical responses. Disruptive violence, fugitive flight and withdrawal, large-scale practical activism and quietistic accommodation. And one last thing to note about these stances is that you don't always get to choose. I mean, in a certain sense, I presented it in a very voluntaristic way. You've got your four stances and you sort of sit down and choose. But in some traditions, you don't get to choose. So again, if you look at the Buddha's teachings, he very clearly rules out the enemy stance because hate is one of the three unwholesome roots that the Buddhists must try to uproot. So hateful violence is ruled out. But the Buddha also rules out activism. He's very explicit with his monks. The good Buddhist does not get involved in large scale social and politically reformative projects. What the Buddha endorses is a combination of quietism and fugitivism. He says, if you're gonna live within society, then you have to live quietistically as a Buddhist layperson. The better, better response though, is actually to live as a monk or a nun and fugitively retreat from the world. And the end goal is moksha, anyway, is liberation from the cycle of rebirth. So really the Buddhists are radical fugitives. The ultimate goal is to escape, not from this society or that society, it's to escape from human existence altogether. So not all misanthropes get to choose. You know, the good Buddhist is doctrinally committed to quietistic fugitivism. Okay. So I presented a working analysis then of misanthropy taken from the work of David Cooper, and I've described to you these four different um, stances. I've only got one last thing to do, which is to correct a, mis, um, a misconception that I might have presented. Now, given this pluralism, we've seen that it's wrong to think that misanthropy must involve hatred or violence. Only some forms of misanthropy do. But I don't want you to think that being a misanthrope is really a matter of surveying the four stances and then choosing one. What I see in the work of most of the really reflective philosophical misanthropes is something quite different. Their real struggle is not choosing one stance and sticking with it. It's coping with this painful oscillation between different stances. It's coping with the fluctuation between these different misanthropic impulses. So I'll give you two examples. So one is Confucius. So let me just complicate my account of his life. In his early days, Confucius was committed to large-scale activist projects. He did spend decades recruiting, traveling, inveiling with rulers, and so on. But over the course of his lifetime, um, Confucius 
gradually abandoned his activism and shifted into a quietistic stance. I mean, probably partly after the two assassination attempts. But over time, Confucius came to recognize that his society was increasingly unreceptive to activism. He says, where once the rulers would have at least listened to me, now they just turn me away. Where once there were just a few unworthies in government, now it's fucking full of them. And over time, he recognizes that the conditions for effective activism are just ebbing away. And in that case, Confucius shifted into, into a quietistic stance. He retreats with his disciples into a community. They try to preserve the moral teachings and wait for more propitious times. So as one of the, one um, Confucius scholar says, Confucius was determined to do his best to fulfill his mission as the bell clapper of heaven. So you know, ringing the bell, trying to remind people all the time that they're in a terrible moral state. He was constantly trying to call his fallen contemporaries back to the way, despite his moments of weakness, when he often says, I should just give up. I keep trying and I keep failing. I had high hopes for this ruler. They had a good reputation and they turn me away. They ignore me and they choose to listen to the military advisors instead. He says he has these desires to go off into exile, to throw in the towel. He says he has these constant doubts that heaven has abandoned me, that I'm just on the wrong side of history. He constantly feels that his work is doomed to failure. But he says, despite these repeated failures and the mockery of his contemporaries, he does try to persist. But over time, he recognizes there are such diminishing returns for the activism, he says, I just have to just submit to the desire to become a quietist. And what you see if you read the Analects is Confucius struggling openly with this emotional and intellectual struggle where he's caught between his activism and his quietism. And he doesn't want to be a quietist. He wants to do the work, but recognizes that his efforts are consistently failing, that he's not just being turned away and ridiculed. He's now being violently rebuffed. And you see him struggling then to reconcile the tension between his activist and his quietist impulses. A second example, much more contemporary, is the Canadian feminist philosopher Kate Norlock, um, Catherine Norlock, if you look on Phil Papers. And in a really quite remarkable paper in Hypatia called Perpetual Struggle, um, Kate says just very openly, when it comes to evils done caused by human beings, the situation is hopeless. So in my jargon, she says, he says, if you're really honest and sober and you look at the state of the world, our vices and failings are so entrenched, so pervasive, so ubiquitous. He says, really fundamentally, nothing could be done on a large scale to transform us to what we are. And she says, we are better off with the heavy knowledge that evils recur than we are with idealizations of progress, perfection, and completeness. And what we should do, she says, is cultivate an appropriate ethic of living with such heavy knowledge. And it shouldn't prevent us from doing our best to resist evils, improve the lives of victims and enjoy others. But she says, we have to be, find a way of psychologically accommodating to the fact that our very ambitious moral activistic ideals cannot be satisfied in a world like this. We have to let go of those ideals of progress and perfection and reconcile ourselves emotionally, morally and existentially to a far more modest, much more quietistic sentiment of performing local acts of care, doing what we can for certain persons and doing the limited things we can do on a local small scale to try to improve the lives of particular others. In a certain sense, actually, what Kate recommends is the style of compassion described by the Buddha. So for the Buddha, compassion is not located in world changing projects. Compassion is performed in small, local, tangible acts of care helping injured animals, providing food to the homeless, comfort to the bereaved. It's very small scale and it's very modest and it won't change the wider course of things. But if you read Kate's essay, which I do recommend, you, you see someone grappling very honestly with this complex existential predicament of trying to reconcile their, their misanthropic honesty with their activistic sentiments, but their quietistic realities. And this is what I call the misanthropic predicament. That's the real challenge of being a misanthrope. It's not picking a stance and sticking to it. It's coping with this difficult oscillation between fugitivist and enemist and activist and quietist impulses and dispositions, coping with the way that they grind together in ways that can be disappointing and frustrating because it requires difficult skills like coping with the constant expectation of the frustration of our moral ideals. 
So Confucius speaks of the pain of living in a world, knowing it will never even begin to approach the ideals that you have for it, knowing that certain forms of love of human beings will never be satisfied, and yet finding ways to, to keep sticking amongst those human beings despite this. So the real misanthropic predicament then is coping with this existentially painful fluctuation between these very difficult, very complex attitudes towards human beings and trying to find ways of practically answering the question, how should I live? Which for the misanthrope is the fundamental question. Once you've internalized this vision of the world, how indeed do I live? How do I cope with these conflicting moments of hatred, frustration, despair, sadness, sudden surging optimism in ways that are psychologically and practically sustainable. That I think is a genuine predicament felt by many people. And that I think is what's the fundamental challenge for a philosophical misanthropy. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian, for that fantastic illuminating talk. And I'm sure many people in the audience related to that, not just academically and philosophically, but personally, so thank you very much indeed. We, we will now take a small break. We'll break for five minutes, uh, during which time, if you have questions for Ian, you can type them in the chat, or if you prefer to ask them, uh, you can either type question or raise a hand, and Shuddha will unmute you. So uh... I'm wondering what to say if somebody says, if I, if I say to somebody, people are awful, and somebody responds, well, actually, in my area, which um, you don't know anything about, um, you're not familiar with uh, my town, um, people are really great over here. Um, we still have bad apples in power, but in general, people are great over here, and you're overgeneralizing from what you what is familiar to you. Um, if it's right that this kind of um, misanthropy isn't rooted in uh, an idea of human nature, but in like uh, tied to the current context, um, how can we respond to the that kind of worry if it's contextualized? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, that, that's one of the big objections to misanthropy that I, I, I still sort of grapple with. Um, and I, I'm partly outsourcing my response to my students by setting them essays on this right now. Um, <laughs> I think I'd, I'd offer at least two styles of response to that. So first, um, first, I think a person can point to kind of empirically, as it were, to certain specific structures and features operative in certain societies and contexts. Um, and they can provide, if you like, this kind of localized sociological explanations. Well, you know, it might be the case, but that in that environment, you know, you have these structures or norms or cultures. Um, the problem is that that's going to be very limited because that won't deliver you misanthropy. That will deliver you more criticism of those people there in that environment. And that's too localized for the misanthrope. So the second better strategy, I think, is really the one introduced by Rousseau. It's to point to certain um, sort of fundamental or in a very loose sense, sort of transcendental features of human societies. Um, so the, you know, the one that I think works really well with Rousseau, he says, in any sort of large scale human community, there has to be some social organization invariably those organizations will include not just horizontal organization of roles, but also vertical and vertical organization of ranks, powers, structures, privileges. And in those cases, he says, you've already built a scaffold for vices like competitiveness, ambitiousness, and so on. He says, and those features are sufficiently general that they will obtain in any form of human society, even very small ones. So even amongst all the enormous sociological variety in the forms and structures and arrangements of human life, there are general sort of like transcendental features of any human society as such. Um, the Taoists actually have a version of this argument as well. So Zhuang Tzu is very good at emphasizing that any organization of human society requires that we draw distinctions between peoples and things and objects because distinction making, judgments and evaluations are just essential to any sort of intelligible life. But where you're drawing distinctions and making judgments, you're then immediately and unavoidably at risk of contemptuousness and imposing upon people and, and other sorts of invidious behaviors. And that's the strategy that I would prefer. You point to general sort of transcendental features of human societies as such. And I suppose actually an auxiliary argument as well is to call into question people's capacity to actually identify 
successfully the various vices and failings that they actually have. So in, in, a very, in an overlong chapter of the book I'm writing, I discussed various of these strategies by which people deliberately or not undercount or fail to identify certain vices. So one form of this um, is that we've only inherited contingently an extremely limited, partial and unsystematic conception of what human vices and failings are. I mean, there are certain vices that everyone knows, like cruelty, callousness, dogmatism, everyone here would recognize those. But there's a whole variety of vices that either people don't know or we, that we don't have names for. And this is what you see in a lot of contemporary vice epistemology. Um, everyone knows arrogance and dogmatism, but there are vices with weird names like <laughs> epistemic hubris, epistemic insouciance, epistemic self-indulgence. They don't like spring to the tip of your tongue unless you're sunk in this stuff, but they describe genuine kinds of human failings. And for that reason, I think people will tend to undercount their vices and failings. They, they just won't identify some of them. Or they will engage in subtler behaviours, like refusing to acknowledge certain kinds of vices and failings. Or people rebrand their vices and failings in the ways described by Rochefoucauld. So people will try to find ways to ignore, dismiss, gloss over, or explain away their vices and failings. Um, and that's a very long chapter of the book because people are really good at doing this. So actually, I would question people's abilities to reliably morally appraise the character of their actions and behaviours. Um, and that's what you see in people like Rochefoucauld. Um, and Schopenhauer and, and Kant, and it's why they like lists. So until you have a proper catalogue of the range of human vices and failings, you can't really begin that process of appraisal. And even when you do have the list, it's not as if human beings are, are renowned throughout the cosmos for being systematically honest about their own and others' failings. You know, you can talk about vices, complacency, bad faith. There's a lot of work here showing that human beings are very bad at, deliberately very bad at, this sort of self-appraisal. And once you sort of plug in all of those strategies, I think, you can give an argument that there are general corrupting features of human societies as such and tendencies of human beings individually and collectively to explain this away. Thank you. Rosa, are you satisfied with that answer? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, next, we have a comment and then we'll move to the next question. The comment is from IXC, just FYI. Uh, Plato and Aristotle also had something to say about misanthropy and its positive analog philanthropy. In Phaedo, Plato said how misanthropy may share similar state of mind with misology, dislike of reason. And the Nicomachean ethics, uh, Aristotle said philanthropy is one reason why cities came into place. Just two more names to add to your already long list of philosophers. Yes, so, I thank you. IXC is right. There's a really nice paper by um, Dale Jaquette on um, the connections between mesology and misanthropy. I think partly playing on the idea that, um, you know, at least for many of the many of the ancient Greeks, one of the most distinctive and positive features of human beings is their capacity for rational inquiry and for learning. And so I think for them, failures to properly exercise our epistemic capacities um, is especially salient route into misanthropy. So the good example here, I think, is Heraclitus. So I think he's a sort of proto-misanthrope. There's a clear condemnation of humankind, but without the structural thinking. But for Heraclitus, the failings that really stand out for him as most salient are primarily epistemic failings. Um, ignorance, dogmatism, refusals to think, stupidity, all those amusingly rude remarks about Xenophanes and Homer um, and about the limitations of learning and study. Um, and I think that's a case where a particular style of kind of epistemically focused misanthropy was very, very salient for them. Um, yeah, thanks, IXC. Thank you. Um, next, we have Nick Allen's question. So, Nick. Hey there. Um, so this is quite like similar to what Devesh said, but I'm going to hopefully push it in a slightly different direction. So it's about the contemporary uh, uh, capitalist basically but um one worry i have with with this uh misanthropy um it sort of applying to everyone um even though there's this understanding of the structural faults that are giving rise to it and maybe in specific settings is that it, it gels to, like nastily well with um strategies that are used by corporations to avoid blame for things so it's very common for like to see like and I'm, by corporations I mean like any kind of powerful institution including governments. Um, so it's very common to see like sort of national um, campaigns to sort of get everyone to do their bit for and the environment, for example. 
when when you actually look at emissions, it's like various industrial complexes, both governmental from military spending and and private from big businesses like oil, that are categorically doing all of that. So it isn't really that everyone is equal, equally wrong in in how they're they're um, and equally vice filled in in how they're approaching a great many things, not just the environment, but but various other um, things like that. And, and it strikes me that you, by applying the misanthropic um, lens, you kind of shield that way of thinking. In particular, I was thinking this when you were giving the idea of Donald Trump as like uh, an unusual example of someone who epitomizes this, because it struck me that that's not unusual at all. That's like the rule, right? It is CEOs, like people who own now many more times wealth than the richest kings and emperors ever did and many times more power as well um so basically i i want us to still be able to retain the right to hate the right people relative to how much damage they're actually doing Hmm. well i I think i think for for the prop for the philosophical misanthrope their, their their primary target will always be those collectivized institutions and structures i'm thinking like those um, you now make me think about the, the three features of, of our vices and failings. So ubiquitous, entrenched, and pronounced. I mean, uh, I suppose a primary vehicle by which they become entrenched, ubiquitous, and pronounced will be through their constant practical instantiation through institutions and systems. And that would put a special moral onus on those who operate and design and defend those systems. So I can imagine like many of the eco-misanthropes, you know, they will be targeting like large scale features of our social and technological infrastructure, but also they can reserve a special animus for, for instance, um, you know, climate change knives, for instance. So we know, you know, we know from the work of Naomi Oreskes, you know, there are fairly large, well-organized groups of people working very hard to conceal um, many of the moral environmental realities of climate change from us. You know, famously Shell, um, 1984, were the first ones to identify the reality of the phenomenon of climate change, and they, they sat on the report. So the misanthrope can if they have a properly sophisticated misanthropy, they can balance the critical focus on structures and institutions while allowing that some individuals have a special role to play in the story of how we came about. And that will include those who play um, special strategic roles in maintaining and perpetuating those structures. Um, So Confucius, for example, is very, very critical of the the poor quality of the political infrastructure of his society, but he reserves a very special disdain for those unworthies, as he calls them, who play special roles in maintaining and exacerbating the corruptions of those societies. And he says, you know, within the kind of the broader global misanthropic condemnation, like, you know, we, we need to save, you know, we need to save a few bullets, as it were, for those people. And I think a properly sophisticated misanthropy will do that. It won't be like merely focused on large scale structures. It can recognize that some people have special roles to play in this story, individuals or groups. Um, and they're the ones that Schopenhauer calls the devilish people. He says some human beings do stand out as being especially off. They are devilish, um, he says, and they deserve special kinds of treatment. So I think it would be possible to weave all of that in um, if the misanthropy was complex enough. Okay, that makes sense. I guess my only follow-up would be um, because of the complexity of that and because of the way it sort of on night, like uh, prima facie fits with what I was describing, it might still be dangerous uh, to the extent that that isn't extremely strongly emphasized um, because it can just be co-opted with a, just a rough idea of it anyway. But thank you. Thank you, Nick, for the question. Next, we have a written question by Eileen. Um, and Eileen asks, to what extent does the fact that the misanthrope is a human to play, in the, play a role in the predicament? It may seem more futile to become a fugitive when you can never avoid your own humanness. Similarly, you may think that you can't do much good as an activist because you are yourself a part of the harmful structures and inherit the bad traits of behavior they cause. Yes, thanks, Aline. I I think that that it's a nice encapsulation of of the first person experience, that misanthropic predicament. Um, Again, I think some of the nicest discussions of this are those between... um, Confucius and Zhuangzi. Um, you know, so, so, you know, Confucius, for instance, is, is very brusque in dismissing forms of fugitivism. You know, as he says at one point, he says, you know, we, we cannot run off to the mountains and run with the birds and the beasts. He says, we have to honor our humanity. He says, and that humanity includes our 
our social dispositions. You know, we says, you know, we are creatures who can live in isolation from others, but we cannot flourish in isolation from others, except maybe certain special persons. He says, really, it's, there's a complex system of trade-offs between the various contingent benefits of interactions with human beings and the various contingent risks of being amongst them, like the risks of corruption. And one way that I read Confucius and Zhuangzi is in respective proposals for what that sort of um, conditional participation in human life looks like. I mean, so even Zhuangzi, for, for instance, is often portrayed as you know, an extremely sort of fugitive character, consistent with this enduring stereotype of Taoists as <laughs> long-haired hippies wandering along riverbanks, you know, singing you know, to the birds and the beast. But I mean, that is a caricature. You know, it, you know, we know very well that the majority of those we now call Taoists they still participate in the human world. I mean, you know, Zhuangzi had a wife, he had children, he had you know, interpersonal relationships and friendships. He was participating in the human world. And as he says as well, trying to honor the, honor the human and honor those aspects of human beings that must be fulfilled. And that is, I think, the real heart of the tension. Um, I mean, Kant has a nice term take from Montaigne. You know, human beings have an unsocial sociability. Socially, we need to be with and amongst other people in order to flourish. The problem is we're also highly anti-unsocial creatures as well. And the real difficulty in human life is trying to reconcile these different aspects. And one theme I haven't thought enough about is an emphasis made by so many misanthropes like Zhuangzi and Confucius and Montaigne, that really the, the ultimate and final protection against the decline to total misanthropy is friendship. Those enduring, rich, satisfying relationships with the few good human beings who confirm for us the possibility of good and meaningful human relations, even on a small scale. And that is a case where you know, the misanthropic predicament will involve careful reflection on your values and your preferences and your most fundamental needs for other persons. And in the end, I think that's what will eventually sort of tip the balance one way or the other. But I think in that case, that predicament is ineradicable. It's something that has to be lived out by a human being, determined by their interpersonal relationships, their temperament, the changing state of the world. So Confucius, I think, is clear. At a certain point, quietism becomes practically necessary. The world is too far gone for these sorts of projects to flourish. But there are other human projects we can maintain. We retreat into, retreat into seclusion with our families, with our students. We teach and learn. We listen to music. We share times with one another. That's how we must live now. But that predicament is inescapable. And I think that's one of the frustrations of misanthropy. It locks you into predicament that you have to constantly negotiate. But that just sounds to me like the moral life in a different light. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, thank you, Aline, for your question. We can now move to Michael. Um, yeah, uh, so can you unmute Michael? Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ian. This was a fantastic talk and a, a great topic, so I'm really interested in it. Um, so I think this is, in a way, just a follow-up on uh, Rosa's question about um, epistemic justification for being a misanthrope. So it seems like we're trying to decide whether that's the appropriate attitude. So we look out at the world for evidence about how good or how awful humans are. And then we see people, some doing good, some doing evil. And the misanthrope concludes that humans as a whole are mostly awful, roughly speaking. And so it seems like this requires some kind of expectation about um, the kind of creatures that we might be, right? We're sort of failing relative to some standard, right? That's what makes misanthropy epistemically justified. And so I'm wondering where this standard comes from. So is it, for instance, like a hangover of some kind of religious conception of humans? It sort of makes sense that like in relation to God's greatness, we suck. Um, but suppose you reject that, right? Um, is it a judgment about then our capacity, like the kinds of things that we humans are in some sense capable of, but systematically just fail to achieve? Mm -hmm. But then I wonder like why I think that's right. Because if you look at kind of human history, the evidence suggests that we're not capable of achieving it. So I guess the question is something like, Maybe it's that instead of being a misanthrope, we should think that we um, have a warped conception of the kinds of creatures we ought to be or the kinds of things we can achieve morally. So it's a problem with morality rather than a problem with humans. Mm -hmm. We've got some kind of standard that's too distant from the kinds of creatures that we are. And in doing so, I'm wondering if this sort of line of thinking pushes you then into the realm of doing like ideal philosophy, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you might think that this is one way of 
um, envisioning your project. And I was wondering what you thought about that. Gosh, it's been years since I've been accused of doing ideal philosophy. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, short answer, I, I think there, there are three different stances you can take on the question. So there's, a, there's another taxonomy I draw between misanthropes. So there are what I would call um, retrospective misanthropes. So these are people who are condemning human beings by comparing us backwards with how we used to be. So some familiar versions of this. Um, Christian narratives of human decline since the Garden of Eden. So the story of the fall of man is a form of retrospective misanthropy. Like, you know, when, you know, when, when we were first made, we were outstanding, you know, morally we were fantastic. And then, you know, that bloody snake, that's a form of retrospective misanthropy. Um, the appeal in classical Chinese philosophy to, you know, the prior age of the sage kings, when all was virtue, peace, wisdom, and goodness, and it was lovely. Um, some of the appeals some people make to human life in early and much simpler stages of our evolutionary development in small, simple pastoral communities. In those cases, a relevant standard for comparison is an earlier past state of human beings, and one to which we might possibly and in principle be able to return to. So in those, and those of course, will be highly culturally relative, as you point out. Um, so, you know, appeals to our prior Edenic state are only going to fly in certain kinds of Christian culture. Those appeals to the age of the sage kings were only going to be salient in classical Chinese culture. So then we have a second kind, which is the prospective misanthrope. So these are those who judge us to be at the moment morally subpar in comparison with a future expected or anticipated state of moral development. So good examples here would be uh, the French Enlightenment philosophes like Diderot, d'Alembert, Voltaire. In their writings as good enlightenment thinkers, they're saying, well, you know, once we clear away all the dross of religion, aristocracy and absolute monarchy and release our full moral potentials and do shitloads of science and read some proper philosophy now, in the future, we can anticipate a state of ongoing moral, social and cultural progress. And, you know, and Voltaire especially is just dith dithyrambic about what we're going to be like. So in those cases, their comparison is an anticipated future state of moral advancement and perfection. Um, Steven Pinker, I think, has a version of this, you know, says, looking forward into the future, once enlightenment kicks in and we all start reading Steven Pinker, things are going to become morally illuminated the further we go. Or on some, again, some versions of religious doctrine. So when the future kingdom returns to earth and Jesus comes back and, you know, fixes everything, in the future will be better. But again, the problem, the one you pointed out, those will only be salient for people with certain metaphysical, historical, and doctrinal commitments. So the third option, which I see in David Cooper, is we don't need any of this kind of highfalutin pro and retrospective anticipations. All we need to do is to ask ourselves, what are our existing moral values and commitments? And he says they, they would include, hopefully, things like justice, fairness, compassion, sustainability. Okay, let's look at how we treat animals in the natural world. We are systematically violating these on a massive scale. So David doesn't tell any of these stories about, you know, past moral golden ages or anticipated future states. He says, relative to our existing values and concerns, we constantly fail to fulfill those moral standards. You know, we are not compassionate, fair and just, etc. You know, we are systematically brutal to human beings, animals. And so relative to our current values, we're just failing. Now that would provoke a, the interesting question you uh, float, which is, then do we just revise down our moral expectations about the sorts of creatures we can be? Um, and I think that's Kant's question, you know, the famous of his three questions, for what may I hope? And that, I think, is a question that a misanthrope really needs to ask. What can I expect from human beings? You could scale down the expectations and say, look, if we get through the day with a minimal violence and disruption, solve our coordination problems, and, you know, have a bit of fun along the way, that might be the most we can expect. But of course, people feel the pull to have those more expansive ambitions and they want to do better. And I suppose that's a case where a certain form of activist misanthropy is creeping back into play. That sense, well, actually, no, we can do better than this. I mean, doing better needs to be defined. We need concrete strategies and we need to be realistic about the sorts of creatures we can be. So thinking about your work, well, actually, it might be the case that certain of our political ideals are just fundamentally naive given deeply entrenched facts about human psychology. In that case, we need to radically rethink. But I think once we're asking those questions, we have a sort of misanthropy in practice doing good work for philosophers. And if that happens, then I'm just very happy. We can have a function first misanthropy and say, well, what would be the function of these reflections? Is it to make us better? And is that a tangible aspiration? Yeah. Ajinka, we can't hear you. <laughs> 
Okay. Can, okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm saying thank you, Ian. Thank you, Michael. I know Ian has a commitment in a few minutes from now, so we will have to end the Q&A. Now, thank you, Ian, for your talk, for the Q&A.